Early on, Weinhoek discovered that 40% of the minnows in these pools were heavily infected with a parasite that causes black spot disease. The rest seemed relatively unaffected. When we brought them back to the laboratory and, and started counting the spots, we noticed, well, my goodness, this is really neat. The asexual reproducers were taking much higher loads of parasites than the sexual reproducers on average. Why should they be more parasitized than the sexual reproducers? They were living right beside because they're all being exposed to the same parasites in the water. There should be no fundamental reason for their different parasite loads on these different kinds of, of animals, unless it had something fundamentally to do with being asexual as versus being sexual. But what? The only thing to do was to keep walking and sampling and thinking. Finally, it hit him. He was looking at a real-world demonstration of the value of males, one suggested by an evolutionary theory called the Red Queen. The Red Queen is an elegant idea. I think it's one of the great ideas since Darwin. <laughs> and it goes back to a wonderful scientist, uh, Lee Van Valen, who basically asked about, does evolution stop when things get perfectly well adapted to their environment? He said, of course not. Evolution is a race, and it's much like the race we saw in, in Alice and the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, where they were running just as fast as they can, and Alice says, isn't this curious? The, as fast as we run, nothing seems to change. We're staying in the same place. And the Red Queen says, yes, you have to run just as fast as you can to stay in the same place. You're living in a complex world, a world full of parasites, a world full of viruses and bacteria, predators, competitive species all basically evolving too and the moment any species stops evolving in response to these challenges and threats it's doomed the cloned fish have stopped evolving they're an easy target especially for a short-lived fast evolving parasite but the sexual fish are a moving target each is a new combination fashioned from its parents genes so as far as the parasite is concerned, every individual in that sexual population is a unique and individual challenge. And that slows down the transmission of the parasite through the sexual part of the population. Here was a solution to the mystery of sex. It's the best defense against rapidly evolving enemies. Or so it seemed, until a bad drought dried up the pools, killing the minnows, and throwing everything into question. Eventually the water returned and so did the minnows, having slowly worked their way back up the hill from pool to pool. When Weinhoek checked the top pool, he made a disturbing discovery. Now the parasites were decimating the sexual fish. The clones were doing quite well, thank you. This is absolutely contrary to anything we'd seen for many years previous to this. Now it was completely upside down. Something, something mysterious was going on. Now an opportunity, you see, to do some science. Nature had done an experiment for us. We had to find out what happened, what changed. We collected the fish. We can then examine them uh, carefully. And what we found in, in this case is that the sexual species in the process of recolonization had lost its genetic variation. It had become inbred. Testing revealed the sexual fish to be clone-like. They now resembled each other genetically. And since they outnumbered the true clones, they were being targeted by the parasites. As a final test, Weinhoek conducted a simple experiment. I went downstream with my bucket into a lower pool where the fish still had genetic variability, and I took some fish from there, put them in my bucket, hiked back up the mountain and threw them in the pool where, where the fish had lost variation and came back a year later just to see what happened. And it's just a wonderful result. This parasite load in the sexuals had dropped right down to the levels it used to be in the past. The asexuals now were taking the brunt of the parasite attacks. And when we examined those sexual fish, we found that we had, in fact, successfully transplanted genetic variation into that pool. And you see, that's precisely the point. That's what sex does. Sex generates variability among offspring. And when you take that away from a sexual reproducer by inbreeding them, or cloning them, 
You've lost the very benefit of sex. It's that generation of an immense amount of diversity. That diversity of your offspring it provides challenges to everything around it. Challenges to the parasites. Challenges to the viruses. Challenges to your competitors. That's the beauty of the sexual process is the variation and, and wonderful diversity it creates. The lesson taught by Reinhook's little fish is that passing only half your genes to your kids is a price worth paying. Sex generates variation, which improves a species' chances of survival in a world dominated by relentless competition. For all their downside, males are worth the trouble. Think of them as a female's insurance policy against losing her children to rapidly evolving threats like measles and the flu. If the reason for sex is a bit less mysterious these days, its origins remain much more speculative. Some believe it all got started billions of years ago with two single-celled creatures sharing a chance encounter in the primordial night. They meet and genes are exchanged. That's what sex is all about. The moment is brief, but it leaves them a little bit stronger, a little more likely to survive and reproduce. Males and females came later, when random change produced a creature that was small and fast, which turned out to be an evolutionary advantage. Organisms with reproductive cells like that are called males. Their goal is to find organisms with a different specialty, providing the nutrients life requires. They're called females. These early pioneers evolved in time into sperm and eggs. Males produce sperm by the millions. With so many potential offspring, it doesn't pay to be fussy about eggs. A better strategy is to try to fertilize every egg you can. Eggs are more complex than sperm and take a larger investment of energy. Females make only a limited number of them. Fewer eggs mean fewer chances to pass on genes. And that means females, unlike males, do better if they're choosy. At a deep biological level, males and females want different things regardless of how things appear on the surface. Small sperm versus large eggs. Quantity versus quality. These are the evolutionary roots of the war between the sexes. This war is a lot more than fodder for poets, philosophers and soap opera writers. It can explain a lot about how species evolve and why they look and act the way they do. Charles Darwin was the first to recognize the evolutionary significance of sex. He came to it because his theory of natural selection had a major problem. It beautifully explained why all polar bears have heavy coats. Over time, any trait that improves an individual's chances of survival should spread through the entire population. But it offered no help in explaining the wild extravagances found throughout nature, like the peacock's tail. Yeah, Darwin had a real problem with peacocks. In fact, he once said, the sight of a peacock makes me sick, because he really didn't understand how it could evolve. An extreme reaction, perhaps. But it is hard to see a peacock's tail as something other than an impediment to his survival. They're heavy. <laughs> um, they're difficult to carry around. They take a lot of energy to grow. Uh, they're conspicuous. And basically, they're going to slow an animal down if it's running away from a predator.